Um, just uh, very quickly, um, thanks to all the speakers and moderators, including our very last um, panel, and thank you to all of you for your engagement. I, I think one thing we have effectively demonstrated today is that taking an economic lens to the issues around microbial threats is both illuminating and effective in stimulating um, uh, discussion. Just a, a, so some very quick observations um, from my perspective, just reflecting on the day. Um, one is, first half of the day, we explored the economic costs and risks of three different categories of microbial threat. So we talked about the endemic diseases, likes of TB and HIV. We talked about the emerging the in infectious disease outbreaks, the likes of Zika, Ebola, and so on. And we talked about AMR. Um, is it, I was struck by the fact that those three discussions had a very different feel to them. The first one was very much about burden. Um, the second was got very much into the sort of behavioral aspects of the economic impact. And the third was about the kind of future burden and also the economic impediments to doing anything um, about it. And I think that partly reflects the intrinsic differences between the different categories of disease. But I also think, if we're honest, it partly reflects the fact that the global health community and the economists who work in this tend to operate in different um, silos because we could have had a behavioral economics discussion about the endemic diseases quite happily or we could have had a discussion about the economic impediments to action and so we could have had some interesting cross-fertilization between those um, approaches and I think it points to a broader issue of sort of um, the, the, the kind of silos within us, if I, if I might say. I mean, um, AIDS is typically in the category of endemic diseases, but arguably is the biggest pandemic um, we have faced in recent years and continue to um, face. Um, Zika was thought of as a rather boring endemic disease until the sort of microcephaly aspect of it um, surfaced and it became much more in the category of a sort of health security um, issue. And MDRTB, of course, both sits in the endemic and in the AMR world. So I do think we need to be not allowing ourselves to sort of bucket these things um, uh, too much. Um, just quickly on the conversation about preparedness. Look, both from an economic and a medical perspective, the logic of preparedness, as the panel made clear, is absolutely um, investing in preparedness is absolutely clear. The really puzzling and interesting problem is why we're consistently not doing it. Um, and I think, it, I think one thing, observation I would have, which is a very simple one, which is the political economy of investing in things where success is measured in nothing happening has always been a really, really difficult thing um, uh, to do. And on the One Health side, I agree it's, it's equally um, compelling. Um, the only problem I would say there is um, I have yet to meet somebody outside the global health and global veterinary animal health community who actually really knows what One Health means. And that's quite a problem if you, if you want to get people um, uh, to invest in it. There's a real communication issue um, we face there. Fascinating um, uh, last discussion. Uh, I congratulate Jamie and, and, and the panel. Um, just very quick observation I would have. Um, I, I am fascinated by the fact that somebody who's relatively new to the sort of health world, that, that we're, we're obsessed with a, a pricing and reward model for drugs, which is Rx times price of Rx. And we very rarely diverge um, uh, from that. Um, and it clearly doesn't work for antibiotics. Um, uh, it, because we've ended up with both overuse of existing antibiotics and underdevelopment of a pipeline. But actually, that's only an extreme example. I actually don't think it works for drugs for most infectious diseases very well, because any treatment for infectious diseases has significant positive externalities. If you're charging it on an Rx times price Rx, you will systematically, structurally underutilize um, uh, uh, the drug. So I think there's a broader issue um, uh, there about the structure of reward models for um, drugs. The only good point, the, the only uh, encouraging thing I would say is I don't think, oh, well, I, one other negative, instinctively I don't like IP 
um, solutions because from a policy perspective, you basically don't know what you're paying and there's huge distributional equity issues because somebody is paying for it um, and it may be some people suffering from cancer or something who end up paying for um, the antibiotics. So it's a very odd thing from a policy perspective. But the, but the, the thing, so I'm, I'm more inclined towards the sort of market entry and actually paying for what you're getting as a policymaker. And I don't think we should entirely rule out the world doing quite bold things. Um, I've had the privilege now of joining um, an institution which is an example of the world being prepared to take collective action at a very big scale. I mean, we're talking about a global fund has now deployed 40 billion or so um, uh, of money. It took a, a crisis, a social mobilization, huge political leadership um, for it to happen. But I don't think given the scale of the challenge we're facing with AMR, we should completely rule out um, that at some point, and I, it, it'll take a bit of time in the leadership, at some point we could get to that point. Okay, enough of my observations. Um, I think we have a reception. Where is the reception? Just outside. Thank you again, everybody. I think it's been a really stimulating day and sets, up, sets us up very well for another day tomorrow. Thank you.